Okay, so you want to run D&D, and mostly what you're concerned with is, can I do this? Will my friends show up? Do I have an adventure? Do I know the rules? How do you actually get started? These are all normal things to think about, and if you saw this video, you might conclude that it would be a good idea to start in a tavern. And certainly I agree. However, if D&D becomes a hobby of yours and you get to start a couple of different campaigns, you will eventually get tired of starting in a tavern. You might do something daring, like start with the party already standing outside the dungeon. Classic. How do you all know each other? I don't know. Who cares? But sooner or later, you will wonder what is the most exciting way to start a D&D campaign. Hey everybody, Matt Colville here, and that is the question we'll be talking about in this video. The hot start. I think of a hot start as anything that requires more work than we're first level characters who meet in a tavern. That is a slow burn. Slow because it usually takes a while before the players really even know who their characters are outside of what's written on their character sheets. So a slow burn is the normal way you start a campaign. The blacksmith barges into the inn late at night and exclaims that goblins have stolen his child. I guess we'll go save her. Modern adventures tend to come with a hook. Something happens and you are expected to respond to it. You are assumed to be a group of disparate, itinerant adventurers who come together to stop the villains from doing whatever they were going to do. A slow burn is a very low impact way to begin a campaign. It's easy. It's easy to do. It works and it's fun. There's nothing wrong with a slow burn. But after a while, you start to think, what else is there? Are there more exciting ways to start a campaign? Yes. In fact, I think any way is more exciting. But most hot starts require more work on the part of the DM. However, that means greater reward if it works, which it doesn't always. But part of the fun of being a new DM is trying new, exciting things. Probably the hottest start is an in media res beginning, Latin for in the middle of things, or in the middle of the action, also known as the Raiders of the Lost Ark opening, which is really the James Bond opening. I ran a game for some friends. They all made characters for a one-shot. I gave them no background, and when we started, I described them standing in a dark stone passageway carrying torches. There was a massive stone door before them with runes on it. One character chants in Draconic, and the door slowly starts to rise, just as a horde of lizard folk, like two dozen of them, come storming down the corridor, screaming at them and waving spears. The players freaked out. They said, we squeezed through the door and then disabled the mechanism that lifted the door, causing it to slam down just before the rampaging lizard folk reached it. Turning around, they saw stone stairs leading down into the darkness, into the second level of the dungeon. That was the first 60 seconds of the adventure, and it was great. Very dramatic and a fantastic way to start a one-shot. All I did was I took against the cult of the reptile god and... I threw out the first 80% of it. I thought, we'll start with the end of the adventure, just the bottom level of the dungeon. Finish it, then go back to town to get the next adventure. Just as the next adventure is getting exciting, we'll stop on a cliffhanger. And then folks will be motivated to want to keep playing. That didn't work, by the way, because instead of picking one of the three ways to proceed down to the end of the dungeon, the player spent the entire day exploring all three passageways. That was an important lesson. I gave the players choices in the wrong place. The opening dungeon should have been linear. Then they'd get back to town and have a choice of adventures there. That would have worked but the opening was super dramatic and very hooky. In the middle of things doesn't just have to mean in the middle of the action, it can mean in the middle of the story. The Chain of Acheron starts in the middle. It was a new campaign, but it picked up precisely where the last game left off. The heroes are approached by PCs from the previous campaigns. Lady Serial, Lord Kenway, Baron Nicodemus, all former PCs. Most of the players knew who these people were, but some didn't. That's fine, because neither did their characters. The Chain is a mercenary company, and this was just another contract. The real hook for the opening, the thing that made it a hot start, was my decision to open the campaign by having the villain kill a PC in the first battle. But I didn't just pick a random PC and have a demon lord eat them. Phil and Lars were in on the conspiracy. I asked Phil and Lars who would lead the Chain, and Phil said he was down, so I had Lars make a fake character the captain, designed to die in the first episode. 
This was incredibly dramatic and effective because none of the other players knew there was a conspiracy. They all believed what they saw was real. They all believed I murdered a real PC in the first session and it set the tone for the entire game. It left them with the impression that life was cheap in the chain without anyone actually losing a character they liked. I knew this would work because I'd done it before. Back when I worked at Pandemic Studios, the same exact opening, same gambit, and it worked then too. The only problem was we started crunching on Mercenaries 2 and we had to stop. So the chain was an opportunity to actually play out that old campaign that never got off the ground. I didn't have to explain to the players why Ajax was the bad guy. They experienced it. He almost destroyed the entire company. Now they hate him. They like hating him. They have a reason to hate him. It was a way to role play through the backstory of the campaign. Instead of saying, okay, you're a mercenary company who barely escaped destruction and you arrive in capital to lick your wounds and rebuild, they played through the destruction of the chain. Everything up to the point where they arrived in capital was prologue. I love that trick of playing through your character's backstory. I've done it a couple of times. Probably the most successful was the Birthright game I ran for about three years straight. I started by picking three prime mover players. You know, I think most campaigns, the players are divided into players and audience members, and I value both. I had each of these three players make a new first level character, and they each started as a regent of their own domain. One was a duke in charge of their own small country. One was a wizard who had his own wizard tower and access to a powerful source of magic. The other was the king of a dwarven realm. Three unrelated domains. Each of these players thought they were playing through a solo campaign. I hadn't told any of them I was doing anything with anyone else. I played once a week with each of them, and the whole time they were dealing with their own crises as the new regents of their own realms. While they were playing, they'd be dealing with diplomacy, sending messages to other leaders, negotiating with them, and the majority of these characters were NPCs. But some weren't. Some of these NPCs were the other players. So Dave would send a message to this wizard, and John's wizard would get a message from this duke, and he'd reply, and Dave would get a reply from this wizard. These would be mixed in with other messages from other NPCs. So the players had no idea some of these people were other players. I was writing all the messages from the NPCs, and I would take the messages from the players and I would subtly rewrite them in order to make sure we were creating alliances between the players. Then, about after three months of this, some crisis threatened all of them, and the entire group got together for the first time. Three of the players were new and just made new characters, but the other three discovered that the NPCs they were allying with were actually other PCs. And the first time they met, it was amazing. It's like these famous NPCs turned out to be actual players. It made the bond between them all incredibly strong. It lasted through the entire campaign. D&D is great. You, you can sit down to play with your friends and invent a shared backstory together. Sure, this is the first time we're playing these characters together, but we can decide we've known each other for a while. That is a lot of fun but these players actually played through that shared backstory and didn't even realize it until they all teamed up together, Avengers style. I would love to do that again, and I probably will someday, and hopefully you'll get to see it. Another hot start that worked really well was a campaign I played in that started as a one-shot. A friend of mine, my first DM actually, ran at a local game convention. We were all going to the con together, and my friend John thought it would be a great opportunity to take a break from his ongoing campaign. There was this famous mercenary group, I think they were called the Red Falcons, who were like 15th level, way higher than our original characters, and he had a high level adventure he wanted to run that we might never get to naturally. So he made a bunch of pre-generated characters for this adventure, these 15th level mercenaries, and passed them out to us. This is just another different way to start a game, and you might think, I don't want to play a character I didn't make up. And yeah, if John had said, do you want to play in a campaign as these NPCs I invented? We probably would have said no. And maybe because it was a fun throwaway, we had a blast. We played all weekend. We couldn't wait to get back to those characters, and it turned into several adventures, a whole campaign. We made those characters ours. They didn't feel like someone else's. They didn't feel like NPCs we had just adopted. It worked because we came to the adventure without a ton of expectations, all the weight of a new campaign with original new characters. It was just a single adventure at a game convention, but it turned into something awesome. Something I have never seen work is the prison break. I know this is how Out of the Abyss starts, but Out of the Abyss is a special case, and I think it's a good one to steal from. The problem is, sooner or later, every DM seems to hit upon the idea of starting with all the PCs in prison. 
This is not a bad idea. But for some reason, this idea is naturally accompanied by the idea that your character has no gear. Okay, that makes sense. But also amnesia and often no character sheet. I don't know why this incredibly specific idea is so popular, but I have seen it crop up dozens of times in different campaigns. And the problem with it is it puts too great a burden on the players. The DM sets up this scenario and then sits back and asks, what do you do? I think this is an attractive idea because it seems very dramatic. Each detail seems to layer on more drama. But what the DM doesn't realize is that they've basically created the most frustrating scenario possible. I don't know who I am or what my character can do or why I'm in jail. None of this is particularly fun. Then I've noticed DMs tend to put the burden of escaping on the players. Instead of making getting out obvious but challenging, they make it very obscure. In fact, they often try to thwart the player's good ideas because they think that makes escaping prison harder and therefore more earned. But that's, it's not fun. I think many of these impulses by themselves are fine, but this perfect storm of ignorance and impotence is uniquely unfun. And if I'm advising you, best avoid it. Out of the Abyss works because you don't have amnesia, you have your character sheet, you know who imprisoned you, and you are surrounded by other NPCs who can help fill in the story. And the game makes it very easy to escape. That is a well done prison break. And notice, Out of the Abyss doesn't put any special burden on the players. You don't need to make a special character for this. It just works. In my D&D game, my players failed to stop the Queen of Winter from taking over the world in 3rd edition, and as a result, my 4th edition game started with the players making new characters who were prisoners of the Night Elves. In the first adventure, they had to take over the labor camp they were all prisoners in. It was basically the Great Escape, except they weren't going anywhere, they were just getting rid of all the Nazis. They all made characters without knowing the premise of the game. Then before we started, I told each player the hook. You are here because you are one of the most effective members of the Resistance. They don't want to kill you and make a martyr out of you, so they're putting you in a special camp, one in the middle of a dark forest a thousand miles wide. Even if you escaped, you have no idea where you are and no way to get home. I gave each of them a message from the leader of the Resistance, who they know only as X. Each player got a different message telling them what to do when the uprising started. There were weapons hidden around the camp, some of the guard towers were booby-trapped. We start playing and the players spend about the first hour just getting used to being prisoners in this prison camp and dealing with the guards. Then a fight breaks out and the game was on. We were playing D&D and the players were using their new characters to fight the leaders of the prison camp. A first level character in 4th edition is already a hero, about as tough as a 3rd level 5th edition character, so all of this was plausible. The players had a lot of fun inventing new ways to thwart the guards and sow chaos, and it was just a blast. Everyone thought another player was X, and then X turned out to be an NPC who died during the uprising, leaving the players to their own devices. This worked incredibly well. Defeating the guards was challenging but obvious. Then the players found themselves in the middle of a massive trackless forest with 47 other NPC prisoners to care for and a violent world to investigate. Every session in that game, something amazing happened. That was a hot start, a setup. The players are together for a very specific, elaborate reason, and it requires some buy-in. Some people ask me about session zero. I think the most important thing you need from your players is buy-in. That's what the Pitching Your Campaign video is about. Another prisoner-related campaign I played in was The Condemned, run by my friend Jordy. This was another fourth edition game, and it was a blast. Our characters were each prisoners sentenced to death. We are given the choice to either face our sentence or go on what will probably be a suicide mission for a special government department. If we succeed, our records will be erased and we'll be free. This was awesome for a lot of reasons. It let us all make characters we would never normally make. It was the best evil campaign I ever played in, because there was never the opportunity for any real inter-party conflict. Our characters each had a collar around our necks, and if we didn't follow orders, it would explode. If we tampered with it, it would explode. If we fought amongst ourselves, it would explode. In fact, we were gonna have to work very hard just to stay alive. The result was very cinematic. We bickered, we sniped at each other, there was a lot of showy bravado, but it was all to further the story. It was all in genre, and we all played along. One of my friends got to play like a, a comic book psychopath, like Mr. Hyde from the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I got to play the head of an enemy spy network. It was super fun, one of my all-time favorite characters. Each of these examples involved a lot of artifice. 
None of them are standard openings to a campaign, not all of them begin in the middle of the action, but all of them come up with a dramatic, unique reason for the players to know each other. And I made this video because I wanted you to think about more interesting ways to start a campaign, but I also just wanted to give you a bunch of ideas to inspire you. I feel confident something in this video has sparked an idea in your head, even if it has nothing to do with any of these examples. What is the most exciting start to a campaign you've experienced? Let me know in the comments below. I read all of them. That's it, folks. That is the hot start video. I hope this inspires you to try something crazy in your next campaign. If you like this video and want to help support the channel, come by our store. You can pick up a copy of Strongholds and Followers or pre-order Kingdoms and Warfare. Also, we have a ton of dope minis in there you can pre-order that will be available next year. If you want an alert when we upload a video, click the bell icon down there. You can follow us on Twitter, and we have an incredibly popular Discord, as well as a great subreddit if you want to just hang out and talk about nerd stuff. Links to all this in the doobly-doo. Finally, every time we do a new video, we do a live stream here on YouTube at 11 a.m. on Friday. The last one was a blast. It was about two hours, lots of great interaction, great questions. Come hang out. It's always cool. Until next time, peace out.